Okay, it is 6.05. We're going to go ahead and get started. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here this evening. Today, we are pleased to welcome Ms. Jenny Dees, a very special guest from Lake Charles. Jenny is an occupational therapist with Therapy Works and provides PRN services to West Cal Cam and Early Step. Today, she will be sharing with us her expert opinions on play and learn therapy that could be provided in the home. All lines are muted, so please put your questions in the chat box. We ask that you hold all of your questions until the end of the webinar. With that said, I ask that you give your full attention to Ms. Jenny Dees and help me welcoming her. Ms. Jenny? Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. So my name is Jenny, and I've been an occupational therapist for about five years. I've worked most of that time in pediatrics, and I'm going to pull up my PowerPoint, so give me one second. Okay, so... Oh. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about playing and learning at home. So basically, a lot of people aren't able to get therapy in outpatient settings right now due to the coronavirus. So I'm going to try and share a few tips on things you can do in your everyday life to help uh, incorporate some of the things you may be working on in therapy. So first, um, just in case anyone doesn't know, because a lot of time people ask, what is occupational therapy? So according to the dictionary, occupational therapy is a form of therapy in which patients are encouraged to engage in vocational tasks or expressive activities like art or dance, usually in a social setting. Basically what that means is occupational therapists are here to help a person do any activity that they want or need to do in their daily lives. We work on anything from self-care and dressing, grooming, bathing, we do strengthening, we work on your fine and gross motor skills, visual skills, emotional regulation, sensory processing, and a lot of what we do in pediatrics, we do through play. So play is, uh, the definition of play is to exercise or employ oneself in diversion, amusement, or recreation. Um, that's just a fancy way of saying that's how we entertain ourselves. In adults, we call play leisure. In kids, it's play, and play is the main occupation of childhood. That means a child's job is nothing but to play. They learn the most through play, and that's what they're the best at. Children do a lot more than just entertain themselves through play, though. They develop skills like motor skills, social skills, sensory processing skills, emotional skills. They gain strength, they explore the world, and most importantly, they learn and ask just about any parent or pediatric therapist out there, but they will tell you that the best way to teach a child a skill or to strengthen an existing one is through play. If they aren't interested, then they're not going to participate and they're not gonna learn it. So you have to meet them where they're at. So I'm gonna go into three ways on which we can incorporate therapy goals into play activities. So the three ways I'm gonna talk about is positioning, uh, working on fine motor skills and working on sensory processing skills. So as you see these two little ones right here, it's just a picture I found on the internet. They have some apple stampers and they're having fun playing. What they don't realize is that they are working on their strength, their coordination, they're working on their grasp, they're working on processing textures and smells. So they're doing a lot more than just playing. Excuse me, Jenny. Can you check your screen to see if you're sharing the PowerPoint? Because I don't see it yet. Oh, wait, just about to say that. Yep, I was just about to say that. <laughs> okay. There well, it goes. goes. All right, guys. How's that? Very good. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, sorry. I don't know why it falls. <laughs> okay. So first we'll talk about positioning. Positioning is one of the easiest ways that you can take an activity a child is already doing and playing with and make it more therapeutic and more beneficial for what they want to work on. There's two ways that you can work on positioning. You can either position the child or position what the child is playing with. So um, there's a lot of fancy terms for positioning and how we're sitting and what we're doing. 
Um, a few of them, I'm just gonna go through real fast because we'll talk about all these later. So prone is laying on your stomach, supine is on your back. You can sit in all sorts of different ways. Quadruped is in a crawling position, kneeling and standing. So this picture in the corner is my two daughters. As you see, um, one of them is on her stomach. She was practicing tummy time. And the other one decided that she'd make a great table to play her toys on. So yeah, they were doing that and they were cute. Okay, so the first thing I wanna talk about is laying a child on their stomach. The purpose of laying a child on their stomach, which a lot of people call tummy time, is to work on your muscles so you can build up strength to extend against gravity. Um, tummy time isn't just for babies though. A lot of um, older children and toddlers and adults too are lacking that core strength to stay upright. And that is important for all sorts of things. If we don't have enough strength to stay upright, we have trouble sitting in our chairs. We have trouble standing up. We have trouble doing all the things we need to do on a daily basis. So this is one of my favorite ways to incorporate therapy goals into what a child is already playing. You just have them lay on their stomach. If they're playing a puzzle, it's easy. Put them on their stomach. Let them reach in front of them to grab their pieces. Um, if they're watching TV even, they can lay on their stomach. It's much more functional that way than just sitting on the couch. They can read a book on their stomach. You can have siblings interact. If you notice these two little ones are looking at each other. So that's an easy way to incorporate it. And I'm gonna give you all a few of the tips that I use for kids that struggle with laying on their stomachs, um, especially some of my little ones. So you can put them over a roll or on a wedge, or you can even provide some pressure at their hips. So I'm gonna go to the next slide. And this gives you a few examples. So if you look at the little boy in the top left corner, he is over a big exercise ball. So he's doing this while he's playing a game. And what he's doing in this is he's building his strength even more than he would be on the floor, but he's also putting extra weight through his hands. So he's working on developing his hand skills. This is something you can do at home. If you have an exercise ball, you can do that, or you can take a heavy duty blanket and roll it up so it becomes a big roll. And that's something you can put your children over so that they can get more benefit out of what they're playing. Another thing, if you look in the top right corner, tummy time for infants, this one is mainly for infants. A lot of people think that tummy time has to be them on the floor with toys. That's totally not true. Tummy time is anything that they're on their stomach. And one of the best ways to work on tummy time in kids that struggle the most and that younger population is to put them on your chest. You lay on the sofa and let them lay on you they will tolerate it much better and they're still getting all the benefits of weight bearing through their arms and strengthening that they would be on the floor. So this little guy in the middle, it's just um, a different way for these little ones to be over something. So he's over this little, I don't know, some toy that's marketed, but you can do the same thing with a towel. Roll up a towel and place it under their arms and you can adjust the thickness to give them more or less support as they need it. Um, so then, Another thing that a lot of kids find really fun is to look in the mirror. So lay them on their stomachs and let them look in the mirror. And then for our toddlers and kids that are a little bit older, you can even put stuff on the mirror, have them reach up and play stickers. You can have them writing in shaving cream on the mirror. You can have them uh, coloring, doing anything. And they'll find that a lot more fun. And so they'll be playing, but at the same time, they're building up the strength they need to do all the tasks when they get older. And then this last one in the bottom right, you'll see this little boy, he's on a scooter board. Um, this one is, I usually don't do scooter boards with kids under about two and a half, just because they don't quite get the concept and they fall off too easily. But this is one of the funnest ways for me to get kids to do tummy time and work on that extension. And if you don't have a scooter board, that's okay. Another way you can do it is if you have hard, uh, hard floors like linoleum or wood, lay a blanket down and have them hold onto a towel or a rope and you pull them around the house. They'll slide on that blanket, they'll think it's tons of fun and they're doing lots of work at the same time. Okay, so the next way I wanna talk about is laying on your back. So playing on your back is also important because it develops shoulder strength or arm strength and shoulder stability. This is important for being able to use your hands for fine motor tasks like handwriting. 
if you don't have enough strength and support in your shoulders and your core, you will never be able to use your hands to functionally do fine motor tasks. So for babies, we have all these little gems with overhead bars and stuff, but one of the easier ways that I've found is, especially for little bitty babies, stick them in a laundry basket and put a broom over the top of it and you can hang toys off of there. It works just the same and you don't need a fancy game for it. For some of my older kids and toddlers, what I like to do is let them lay under a table and if you need to put a mat or something under there, a couch cushion so they can reach the top and let them color on the table. They are doing all sorts of work strengthening their arms and shoulders and they're having fun while they're doing it. Um, if you look at the little baby in the corner, this is a therapy trick that we use for kids that have trouble being able to reach up and keep their arms upright up in the air to play with toys and stuff. If you put them on an incline, that helps take some of that um, some of that gravity pressure away. So they're better able to interact and play. You can do this with young kids. You can do this with old kids. If you have a baby and you have a bouncer, that's great. But if you don't and you have an older kid, a lot of couch cushions are kind of angled. So put them on a couch cushion and that works just as well. Or recline a chair and put toys over them, hang toys, hold toys for them, whatever. For even older toddlers and children, they have a lot of fun playing games on their back. So this little boy in the left-hand corner, he is, what it looks like he's doing is he's using his feet to kick a ball to someone who throws it at him. They have a lot of fun doing that, but, um, and that really works on the core as well. Something else that you can do that I found out recently, and I couldn't find a picture of it to put it on, but I've had some of my kids do it in therapy, is have them lay on their backs and put a laundry basket by their head and a bunch of stuffed animals by their feet. They have to use their feet to grab the stuffed animals and bring their feet over their heads to put it in the laundry basket. That is a great, great, great core strengthening activity. And it works on coordination because they have to figure out how to close the feet and grab the object and bring it back over their head. So another way that we play and our kids play is sit sitting. There's all sorts of different ways for sitting. So I'm gonna go over a few of them um, and all these can be used differently. So prop sitting, that is what you think of in the youngest, like the first stages of sitting in our youngest babies that sit up. They're sitting up, but their hands are forward and all their weight is on their hands. At this, when they're sitting like that, they can't use their hands for anything. So if we have an older child sitting like that, they can't use their hands to learn and play, and that's something that we need to work on. And usually that indicates that they have a problem with balance or core strength. The next way that kids sit is called long or ring sitting. That's when you sit with your legs straight out or they kind of make a circle in front of you. This is a way to sit that provides a lot of stability, but it limits how much you can reach and turn. So a lot of toddlers I find love to sit like this when they play, and that's that's great and fine, but they're not strengthening their cores as much as they could. And so if they only sit like this when they get to pre-K and kindergarten and are expected to sit upright in a chair with their feet on the floor and pay attention and do a worksheet, they're not going to be able to because their brain is so focused on building up the muscles they should have felt when they were itty bitty so they can stay sitting upright in their chair. So when you see kids um, older than probably about 18 months, two years old, when you start seeing them and they're constantly sitting like this, that kind of lets us know we need to kind of change the way they're sitting so they can work on those muscles. What I like to do is put them in what's called tailor sit, but most people call it crisscross applesauce. That is one of the best sitting positions that we have because it allows your hands to do anything you want them to do and it allows you to reach in any way you want to reach. So whenever kids are playing and sitting, I like to encourage them to sit in this crisscross applesauce position. And something else I do is I take toys and place it on either side of them. This forces them to turn their body in both directions to reach to grab the toys. So you're working on core strength, you're working on balance, all while they're playing and they don't have a clue you're doing it. Doing it. So one position that therapists always talk about is W sit. This is, and I'll show you a picture on the next page, but if you think about like the classic childhood playing ad, this is the little kid that's sitting on their bottom with their feet behind them and their body, their legs and their body make a W. This position is not good at all. 
both for development and for just joints in general. It can cause damage to the joints long term and it can cause pain, but also it prevents all the core strengthening that we want the child to do while they're sitting. So if you see a child sitting like this, what you need to do is help them to sit a different way. And that's not, that's, let me rephrase that. Young, so babies around a year old and younger than that, they will sit in a W position sometimes and that's okay, they're still learning. But anything older than that, you really wanna change this position and teach them a better way to sit. But instead of just taking their legs and turning them, what the best way to do it is you need to teach their body how to come into sitting in a better way. So the best thing to do is to stand them back up and then help them sit back down in either crisscross applesauce or even side sit. I really like side sitting as well, especially if you have a child that needs to work on arm strength and fine motor skills. Side sitting, think of like how the cheerleaders sit at um, like pep rallies in middle school and all that. They sit with their legs to one side, leaning, leaning over, and a lot of times they have a hand to the ground. That is something that we use in therapy all the time because putting extra weight through an arm or hand helps you to be able to use it better. It gives the brain more cues of where it's at and how to use it. So if you have a child playing, have them sit in this position if they need to work on one arm or fine motor skills in general, or if they need to get stronger. This is a great way to do it. Okay, so here, this is just showing you some of the sitting positions. If you look at the position with all the babies, so the two little boys in the front, they are in, or the one little boy on the left in the front, he is in like a longer ring position. So you notice he can use both of his hands Whereas the boy on the right, he's in a prop position. His hands are on the ground, and so he can't use them to play. Um, the two little ones at the back are kind of in the middle. So the little boy on the right-hand side of the screen playing with the puzzle, that is a great way to incorporate a side sit into an activity that kids play every day. You put the puzzle pieces on one side, and they lean on that arm, and then they do the puzzle in front of them. They are getting core strengthening and weight bearing, through their arm while they don't even know it. And you can even switch it up where halfway through the puzzle, you switch sides and go to the other side. So on the bottom of the screen, the little girl in pink, that is the W position I was talking about. That is a position we want to avoid. Um, the other two little kids down there, one of them's in sort of a crisscross applesauce and one of them's sort of kneeling, but it was mainly the W sitting I wanted to show you there. Okay. So then we can move on to quadruped, which is crawling. This position is actually where all of our visual skills develop. We develop depth perception, tracking, vergence. Vergence is just, uh, think about if you see someone move a finger towards their eyes and they cross their eyes, not to that extreme, but it's the ability to bring our eyes together and move them apart so that we can see things close up and further away. And this skill is really important in a lot of things that people don't realize. For example, a lot of my children that I see now have trouble and they are unable to copy words from the board. And it's not that they can't write, it's not that they can't see, it's that when they look down at their paper and then look back up at the board that's far away, their eyes don't work well enough together to figure out what's on the board. And it takes them so long that they're not able to keep up. So playing in this crawling position is something that I do a lot with these kids because this is where that skill develops. Oops, wrong button. So one of the things that we do in therapy for our kids that have trouble getting in that position is using that roll again. So take your towel and roll it up, take your blanket and roll it. If you need it thicker, you can, use, you can adjust the thickness based on what you need. And if you look at that little boy on the top right, I don't know if he's over a ball or what, but it helps support his core and allows him to stay in that crawling position. So this is also great for babies when you're teaching them to crawl. You can even use your leg if you want to. You can lay him over your leg and the bottom part of your leg is skinnier for a skinnier roll. The top part of your leg is thicker for a bigger roll. The little boy playing with the race cars on the track. Playing and crawling is great. He is working on visual tracking. He's putting weight through his arms and hands so that he's developing motor skills. So this is something that you can do. Put your kids, uh, if you go outside, draw a race car track with sidewalk chalk and let them crawl around and zoom their race cars if they like race cars. For little girls, you can just have them on their hands and knees and have them reading a book. 
a lot my my two girls love that so the little girl in the bottom left something else that i do with quadruped and i couldn't find a picture of this is i take like a little stool or a table and i put it in front of them and put the pieces for the game on top of that that forces them to look up while they're doing it which adds a whole new level of strengthening and development to it as well so that's something that's really easy to do and really good to do as well okay kneeling um is another way that we play and i really like kneeling because kneeling helps us to build core strength when we're kneeling our knees are generally closer together and so that forces us to use our core more to stay upright and balanced than if we were sitting where more of our body is in contact with the ground there's different ways to kneel as well you have tall kneeling which is if you think of people kneeling at church that's that position and then half kneel which is if the best example I can give is think of how guys get down on one knee when they propose. That's a half kneel. So one thing that I do is I let kids play in kneeling and a lot of them have trouble staying upright. So if you notice the um, top picture, you see how the person has their hands kind of at the baby's hips and their thumbs on their bottom. That is a good way to hold a child, even older children, to help support them so that they can be stable enough to gain strength and play while they're kneeling. So that's something I like to do. And as you see, he's got the toys up high. You want to have your toys at, at their eye level so they can really see what they're doing and be encouraged to stay up. If they're on the ground, they're just going to want to sit down. And then the little girl in the bottom, she is in that half meal. For some of our older toddlers and older kids, what I really like to do is move between that half meal position and then have them stand up to do something. So just like she is at the table, you can have a table a little higher and you put um, pieces for a puzzle or pieces for their Peppa Pig game or their race cars or whatever they're interested in playing in. Just put the pieces on the ground and a few on the table. Whenever they want to get a new piece, they kneel down and they can pick it up and then they stand back up and they keep playing. So that they never know that they're working, that they're building all these strengthening skills. They're building these sensory processing skills. To them, they're just playing. And so they're gonna do much better than telling them to kneel down, stand up, kneel down, stand up. Okay, the last way that we play is in standing. Standing is the hardest way to play and standing still is much, much harder than moving while standing. So when your child is standing, something that you wanna look for is, are they constantly swaying back and forth side to side or can they stand still and play with an object? If they're constantly swaying back and back and forth and side to side, that could indicate problems with um, their core strength or their sensory system. It kind of just depends on the child and would take a further analysis. Um, but, uh, sorry, different ways of standing. So when I have kids playing in standing, I like to have them play on what's called a vertical surface. Basically, they're playing on the wall. Um, you can hang paper from the wall, you can play on a mirror, you can, one of my favorite things to do with my kids now that it's hot outside is I let them paint the fence. They take a bucket of water and a paintbrush and we go outside and they paint the fence. They think they're painting, they're having lots of fun and they are working on standing and also working on a vertical surface, which we'll talk about later, helps develop fine motor skills. So some ways that you can, uh, if your child's really good at standing, some things that you can do to make it harder and make it even more therapeutic for them is have them stand on different kinds of surfaces. So get a pillow and have them stand on that. That soft surface provides a little bit of movement underneath their feet, so they have to really work on balance. Or you can get what's called a dynamic surface. This is something that really moves back and forth. A rocker board, um, as you see in the bottom picture, which I don't necessarily recommend. This was my daughter one day. She decided she wanted to play stickers on the wall and she couldn't reach, so she decided to stand in her rocking chair. So she was really, really, really challenging her strength and her balance. Um, but there's other things they make rocker boards or you can just um get get a couch cushion and put something in the middle of it so that both sides tilt and turn that's a good way to work on it as well for kids that are just learning to stand if you look at the picture on the top left you'll see how they're holding him again right at those hips that is a great way just like with kneeling to help children have enough stability to stand and interact and work on all that strengthening. And something else I like that he is doing is he is reaching up. 
So whenever your child is playing, if they can be reaching up, that helps them to, to build that strength even more. What we're looking for is being able to move in all ways against gravity so that when they're old enough to go to school, they don't have to worry about being able to sit upright in their chair. They can focus all of their attention on the classroom skills at hand. And so that's what he's working on right there. Okay, so another way to work with positioning is positioning the toy. Um, so that's the level of the toy, whether it's at an eye level, it's up tall or it's down low, and then crossing midline. So crossing midline is what happens when a child reaches across their body to perform a task. This is a really, really, really important skill. So if you notice this little baby on the bottom, he's reaching for a toy across his body and um, looking at it as well. So crossing midline is another great way to change up an activity a child is already playing. Crossing midline is important because what it does is it helps integrate the two sides of the brain so that connection messages can go across them for higher level skills later in life. Think of riding a bike, throwing the ball, running, kicking. It also increases the number of neural connections in the brain, which means that things can go through faster. It helps with coordination, and if you don't have the ability to cross midline, you're unable to perform bilateral fine motor tasks, such as cutting with scissors or buttoning a button, stringing beads. If you aren't able to cross midline, you can't do those things. So some ideas on how to get your child to do that. Uh, one of the, one thing you can do is if what they're already doing. If they're playing a game, just take the pieces for the game and put them on their other side and kind of hold one arm down so they have to reach across their body. Um, using eating is another great way, especially if they're already using utensils and they're using one specific hand to eat, put the food on the other side of their tray. That way they have to reach across to get their food. Um, snacks work great for that as well. Put the snacks next to them instead of in front of them and encourage them to use that other arm. This little girl is doing something that I really like. She is drawing rainbows. So she is crossing her body. Now what you'll see in kids that have trouble with this crossing design skill is when they get to the front of them, they're gonna switch hands with what they're using to color. That indicates that they have an issue there and we wanna encourage them to not do that. Um, the two little girls in the upper right, now ignore the fact that one of them's W sitting, but playing clacking games where you reach across your body, that is something that kids love to do and they think it's lots of fun and it's an easy way to get this skill in. Um, the little kids on the bottom with the ball, they're just sitting back to back and passing a ball round and round. We already do this a lot with our kids in our gross motor groups and our classroom things at daycares and they're working on this skill of crossing midline by turning around. And then the other little boy, I saw this on the internet, I thought this was a great idea. He's playing drums on different pieces of paper. So if your child is already working on color recognition, put some paper out and give them drumsticks and they have to play the drums on whatever color you tell them. By giving them a stick in each hand, it forces them, even if they haven't established a dominance, if they wanna play, they have to move across their body. And then the level of the surface of the toy. So reaching up, like if you noticed on the picture, how there's the different lengths of chains. I know there's no toys hanging from them. She, this is my daughter, she pulled them all off. Um, but that is a way to get kids to reach up and encourage them to reach higher. Reaching up is going to help us to stay upright. So it encourages that extension against gravity. If you put things down below, it encourages flexion against gravity, but that's another great way to work on visual development, depth perception, knowing how far to reach to get something. And at eye level, it encourages you to stay upright. So if you have a child sitting, most kids when they're sitting and playing, their toys are on the floor. An easy thing to do is get a little table or footstool and put their toys up at their eye level. That's going to help them to stay upright. As adults, a lot of us have horrible posture, me included, where we're slouched forward and it causes back pain, it causes shoulder pain, neck pain. And in kids who are trying to stay upright at their desk, it really prevents them from being to do handwriting tasks. So if we can start early in life and encourage them to stay upright, it'll make their lives easier later on. Okay, another thing that we do a lot of with play is fine motor skills. So fine motor skills are the ability to make movements using the small muscles of our hands. One of the first things you work on with fine motor mint is grasp. 
So you know babies at birth, they have what's called a reflexive grasp. If you put your finger in the palm of their hand, they're going to close their hand and not let go. Well, at some point that, gives, that goes away and we have what's called voluntary grasp and release. Voluntary grasp and release is the child being able to grab and let go of objects when they want to, and this is really important, important for development. Other things we work on is transferring objects between hands because this is something that we'll need for scissor skills and it encourages that crossing midline and bilateral coordination, using both hands for a task. Then another big one is pincer grasp. So that's your thumb and your index finger to pick up small objects. And tripod grasp is for our older toddlers who are working on pre-writing skills. Pre-writing skills are not handwriting. That is the basics that you need before you ever start your ABC. So grasp. So some things that I like to do, look at that little boy in the left hand corner. This is one of my favorite toys. It's a basic rattle and it works for all ages. For our youngest ones who are working on voluntary grasp and release, their fingers get caught in those little holes. And so they hold on to it and they're forced to hold on to it even if they think they're going to let go. So they learn how to grab and let go at will. Another thing that I like about this rattle is it's long. If you're working on a child transferring objects between hands or holding on to two things at once, this is great for that because it allows their hands to stay on the same side of the body that the hands on. So the right is on the right, the left is on the left. Because most of the time these kids can't cross midline, they're way too young for that. So it allows the hands to stay there while performing tasks together. Um, in older kids, you can work on shaking and copying motions. Another thing that I like um, for young babies or kids that have a lot of trouble with movement is wrist rattles. So you see the little girl, it's just a strap that attaches to your wrist and they also make them for their feet, little socks. And it helps them to be able to gain more awareness of where their hands and feet are and that they can actually do something. Okay, so we get a little bit older and we're working on our pincer grasp. That's using our thumb and our first finger to pick up objects. A lot of kids struggle with this, especially, and I don't know if there's a causation or a correlation between this, but I've noticed that as iPads and cell phones and devices are more in use, kids tend to use their long finger instead of their pointer finger to pick up objects. My theory on that is because the long finger is the longest when they're little and they're first starting on these tablets and stuff, that's the finger that touches first and that's the one they use to control. The problem is for Cool. handwriting is controlled all the movements of a pencil for um, for like nice handwriting is controlled by your index finger so if they don't learn how to use their index finger at a young age their handwriting is going to suffer so for our kids whenever they're coloring um, something I like to do is give them a broken crayon take all my crayons and break them in half take my pencils and use golf size pencils this forces them to use more of the correct graph pattern than, rather than use a full fist over it. Another thing, and I always say snack time, do snack time in this because I, your kids are like mine, they love snacks. So Cheerios, Puffs, gummies, fruit snacks, cereals, anything that's small, take those and put it in like a Dixie cup. Cut the Dixie cup in half if you have to. Um, and they can't get their whole hand in there to grab that food. They have to use their pincer grasp in order to do it. Another thing is when you put food on a plate, instead of putting all the Cheerios in a big pile, spread them out over the plate. This will encourage them to grab them more one at a time than just grab the big handful. Um, and this little, this other little boy, he's got, it looks like Play-Doh and pasta, and he's putting, I think he's sorting by color too, but he's putting cereal on pasta. That's a great idea. It works on visual motor skills. It works on fine motor skills and it's fun. Kids will think it's really, really fun. Another thing that you can do is use tongs or tweezers to play games. Um, let them, a lot of kids have game pieces that are kind of small. Give them a pair of uh, big tongs or big tweezers and let them use those to move their pieces around. That will work on hand strengthening and it'll work on grasp and it'll really help them later in life. So these are some other things, like you notice how I was saying about the tongs, this little boy is making, I can't tell if it's veggies or fruit, I think it's veggies, and he's using the tongs to pick them up. This other little one has an ice cube tray and he is working on his pincer grasp. Um, you can also sort by color with this, but basically it's just preventing him from using all his hands. 
And another thing I like is clothespins. Clothespins are great for all sorts of strengthening and grafts. And I think y'all can still see me, but this is one of my current favorite things that I do with my kids is I let them cut out color and cut if they work on cutting um, pictures and I glue them on the clothespins and then they have these fun little toys that can eat things. So, okay. Now I wanted to talk a little bit about pre-writing. I know most of the kids are younger than this age, but a lot of people i found try and push uh, writing the alphabet really, really early. And that's okay, but the problem is you need to make sure that these shapes on this figure are, the child is able to draw all these before you move to handwriting. Otherwise, what's gonna happen is they may get the, the shape right, but they're not forming it correctly. And it, when they get to cursive, it's gonna cause problems with handwriting. And I see a lot of kids that start really struggling around that cursive age because they never learn to form their letters properly. So this is just to show you about what age. So really two-year-olds, two and a half year olds, they can do a line, three-year-olds can do a circle and you don't develop diagonals until after four. So, um, so some things you can do to help uh, these pre-writing skills, instead of just having them write their alphabet in these little kids, have them put stickers on a line, have them trace. You see that the person with the Q-tip, they have broken Q-tips, so they have to help their grasp. One of the best things you can do is to change the medium that they're writing in. Give them sand, give them shaving cream, give them rice, give them dirt. They think it's a lot of fun and they're building a lot of skills and working on their sensory processing at the same time. And once again, we have working on a vertical surface, how I kind of talked a little bit about earlier. That helps do shoulder strength and stability all while working on fine motor skills. Um, so this just kind of shows you the difference in the child's grasp using a full marker versus a shortened crayon. And this little girl, one of my uh, favorite activities to do, and I, if you don't have a chalkboard, you can do it on cement, you can do it on the sides of your house, you can do it on the bathtub wall. Give them water and paint or chalk or something and let them write, either you write it with chalk and then them erase it with the water, or they can write it and then erase it themselves. It's a lot of fun and it works on a whole lot of skills. Okay, another important point I wanted to talk with with um, fine motor skills is establishing hand dominance. That is the inclination to favor one side over the other, and it starts around two years old. It's really important that kids pick a dominant hand um, because our brain is naturally wired to favor one side over the other. And generally, when kids don't pick a dominant hand, it's because they are unable to cross midline. So when you're trying to figure out what your child's dominant hand is, the best thing to do is for a period of time, everything you give them, give it to them right in the center of their body and see if they start to develop a preference for one side over the other. And as soon as you know what their preference is, you wanna encourage that and use your crossing midline activities to strengthen that dominance. Okay, sensory processing skills. That's the last area I'm gonna talk about today. So most people know our five senses, smell, taste, touch, sound, smell, taste, smell, taste, touch, sound, and sight, sorry. But ones they don't know about are the vestibular, proprioceptive, and interoceptive systems. So we're not going to talk much about interoceptive today because that's um, not much we can do about that one. But that is senses coming from your internal organs, so hunger and thirst. The two we're going to focus on are vestibular and proprioceptive because those are really, really important to development. So your vestibular system contributes to your balance and orientation in space. It's located in your inner ear, and it is what tells you about movement and the position of your head in relation to gravity. One of the ways that kids get the most vestibular input is through swinging. I know a lot of people can't go to the parks right now, so this is one way, if, if you tie really, really good knots, get a big sheet and you can make a swing under a table for the kids. Or if you have two adults, have them hold each side of a strong, heavy blanket and swing the child back and forth. The vestibular system is important because if our vestibular system isn't well integrated, which means that it's not processing information correctly, we're unable to do the higher level fine motor skills. So one thing I like to do is encourage obstacle courses. Instead of having the kids just sit and play the puzzle, I have them roll across the room to get the puzzle or ride a bicycle to get a puzzle. Um, rocking courses are a great way. Just something to get them up and moving and wiggling. That, teaches kids a lot more than we ever realize. 
So this one, uh, the baby on the ball, um, if they, you have a big exercise ball, that's a great way too because you're moving them side to side or forward and backward. How we talked about on uneven surfaces and um, things like that. The little boy with the maze thing. I don't know what it is. Okay. And then the last system that I want to talk about is the proprioceptive system. This system tells us where our body is in space. Its receptors are located around all of our joints and in our muscles, and it lets us know that when I'm sitting in the chair, my feet are on the floor, my bottom's in the bottom of the chair, my back's on the chair, I'm not going to fall over. If this system isn't well organized, that's when you see the constant movement due to sensory system. They have to move more in order to know where their body is in space. So if we allow them to play and move, that can help regulate that system. So heavy work activities, if you Google it, you'll find 40,000 lists of things you can do at home. But basically it's anything that causes their body to do work. That's great for that. Row your boat, um, pushing and pulling, jumping, crashing, animal walks, um, joint compressions, deep squeezes, and then burrito roll. This is what my son's favorite thing was. Basically he would lay on a blanket and I'd roll them up and really tight and it would give them lots of compression. This helps the body to be regulated so that they are ready to do those fine motor play skills. So it's something else you can incorporate into a game they're already playing. Have them jump up and down, have them crawl like a bear, have them run, uh, jumping on a trampoline, anything like that. Um, so this little girl, uh, the plunger scooter board, the, that's great for heavy work. Um, it's also vestibular, the little boys crashing into pillows, little boys love to crash into things, but that's what they're actually doing, it's regulating that system. Climbing and swimming is another way, swimming is great for that. Okay, so any questions? I don't know how to get to the questions, let me stop the share. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Let's see. So, do we have any questions? If you have any questions, please, um, you can place them in the chat box. Can we get a copy of the PowerPoint? Yes. Um, at the end of the um, webinar, we will be um, sending out the survey. And after your survey, you will get a copy of the PowerPoint with that. Any other questions? So I had a question. <clears throat> um, how would we be able to know if um, our baby would need OT versus PT? So that kind of depends on the age you're talking about. When you're talking about the really little babies, OT and PT overlap quite a bit. And so a lot of the times it's whether they get OT or PT is if it's not a problem with a joint, then it's gonna be based on who has the availability. Um, it's not till they really start with like kind of the walking stage that we start to differentiate a little more um, into who goes to PT versus who goes to OT. Um, I will tell you that feeding will always go to OT or speech. PT does not do feeding and texture tolerance will always go to OT. Beyond that, it kind of can go either way. Okay. Um, one of the questions that we have is, um, are there any resources, books, or websites that you would be able to recommend? Um, for activities in general or just, so right now is actually a really great time because with everyone having their kids home, people are posting, creative people are posting all sorts of things on the internet. So what you can do, the best thing to do is just do a basic Google search and you will see a ton of different ways you can work on these skills. Honestly, I use that for treatment planning sometimes. I'll Google, if I want to work on pincer grafts, I'll Google pincer grafts activities. And it'll come up with all sorts of cool ideas from really creative people. Um, beyond that, uh, if, it's, if you want to know more about sensory processing skills, um, one a website that I have that's really specific is called STAR, S-T-D. 
they have a lot of really good information on sensory processing and how to incorporate the vestibular and proprioceptive systems into your current activities. Okay. And you said that was SPD? Star SPD. So like sensory processing. Yes. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, um, here's a question. Um, um, does, do your therapists have to have a specialized training in order to treat in a, for a particular condition? No, we do not. Um, there are certifications that you can get um, after you graduate school to qualify you to provide specific treatments, such as uh, one example, uh, torticollis comes to mind. Physical therapists can get special specializations in different torticollis treatments that allow them to provide more specialized treatment. But we are all required to do continuing education after we graduate from school and we gear what we do towards our population that we're treating. Okay, okay, good. Okay, any other questions? Now is the time to ask them. <laughs> We have Miss Jenny. <laughs> okay. Um, how often should techniques be done at home to get the best results? Um, honestly, I'd say incorporate it whenever you can. It's really easy to do these things. Your child's going to eat every day. It's really easy to take his plate and instead of chase, placing it directly in front of him, place it a little to one side or the other. Every day your child is going to lay down for a diaper change. So wherever they get their diaper change, somehow hang something above that so they're encouraged to play with a toy while you're changing their diaper. Every day they're going to, well, if they're at sitting age, they're gonna sit up at some point. So all you have to do is move their body a little bit in one way or the other, and they're getting more therapy out of what they're already doing. Okay, good, good. All right, any other questions? Okay, well, if we do not have any other questions, I would like to thank Ms. Jenny oh, for well, taking you. time out of your busy schedule to assist us this afternoon. We really do appreciate it. <laughs> well, thank y'all very much for having me. I appreciate it. All right, well, this will conclude our webinar for Play and Learn at Home. If y'all have any additional questions, um, y'all can go ahead and email us at fhfinfo at um, dot org. So um, give us a um, shout, send us an email. Um, you can call our office at 337-436-2570 um, and we will answer your questions as best as we can. If I am unable to answer those questions, I will definitely get Miss Jenny on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> you know how to find me. I know how to find you. <laughs> All right. Well, like I said, this concludes us. Thank you, Miss Jenny. I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.